Welcome everyone. And today we are here with Dr. Jonathan Mizrahi and Dr. Sophie Jancic. Uh, and today we will be talking about colon cancer. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and let both of our physicians introduce themselves. A hematologist and medical oncologist. Uh, I'm uh, originally from uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And um, I just started here at Oshner uh, back in August of this year, um, most recently having been in Houston, Texas. Uh, my wife is a native of New Orleans, and that's uh, part of what brought me here and the, the chance to practice at Oshner. I primarily focus on cancer of uh, the GI tract, um, so everything from esophagus, stomach, pancreas, liver, and then, of course, colorectal cancer. So uh, happy to be here. Hi. Hi, my name is Sophie Jancic, and I'm a hematologist, medical oncologist, and I practice at our West Bank location. I am a native of New Orleans. I've lived here all my life, um, except for a couple of years I practiced in the Seattle area uh, after Hurricane Katrina. And I have been with Osher for about 10 years now. So today we'll be talking about colon cancer, uh, screenings, detection, prevention, as well as just a general overview of colon cancer. Uh, so if you do have any questions for Dr. Mizrahi or Dr. Jancic, please leave those in the comments and we will be asking them along the way. And so Dr. Jancic, let's you know start top of the line. What is colon cancer? Hi everyone. Um, colon cancer is uh, abnormal growth or cancer cells in your colon. So what is the colon? The colon is our large intestine. It's about a six foot muscular tube. That's the end of our digestive tract or what we call the gastrointestinal tract. So what can happen over time is the lining, the colon is made up of layers or linings, okay? so. If you have abnormal growth or cancer cells in these linings, these over time can form abnormal growth or something called polyps. And over time, these can become cancerous. Um, and colon cancer can, um, we will talk later about the staging, but it can invade lymph nodes, uh, lymph vessels, and it can also spread to other sites. What's important to know, though, is this is a highly, highly preventable cancer, and that is why screening is so important. Um, it tends to be a little higher in males as opposed to females. I, about 104,000 people this year will be diagnosed in the U.S. with colon cancer. It is the third most common cancer in males and females in the U.S. And again, highly preventable, and that's why screening is so important. So, Dr. Mizrahi, what types of screenings are available for colon cancer? Certainly, we uh, who are interested in being screened for colon cancer, um, and they differ uh, in terms of how invasive they are and exactly what they're checking for. So, these range from stool-based tests. So, what that means is that um, you provide your physician. Uh, or primary care provider with a stool sample. Sometimes it's done something in the office or sometimes it's actually something that you uh, take home a kit and send it back to the doctor or send it to a lab um, and they test your stool. Now there are different stool tests. Some test your stool for blood. And if you have blood, sometimes that can be an indicator that you actually have either a precancerous um, polyp like Dr. Jamfitch mentioned or actually a, a cancer in your colon. Uh, there are other uh, tests that actually test for abnormal DNA. So abnormal um, evidence of genes and um, molecular markings that give some indication that there is either a precancer or a cancer kind of hiding out in your colon. Um, so that's one way of testing, doing a stool-based test. Um, what most people are familiar with is doing something called a colonoscopy. A colonoscopy is basically um, where a, a gastrointestinal physician uh, takes a, uh, a long camera with a tube 
and uh, puts you kind of in, in la la land, you're asleep and, um, and inserts it um, from the bottom and looks inside your colon and they look to see if they see anything precancerous or cancerous. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but um, that's a more invasive test. Now, the more invasive ones, you don't have to do as frequently as the one that are um, less invasive, you do those more frequently. So there's differences in terms of, uh, you know, how we how we approach these, but um, we do have a number of tests. There are a couple other ones that uh, are less popular, but certainly options as well, in which um, they use a CAT scan to visualize your colon, uh, but the most common ones are stool-based tests and a colonoscopy. And Dr. Mizrahi, what age should I begin getting screened for colon cancer? So um, historically, the age has been uh, recommended to be 50 years old. So if you're an average risk person who doesn't have uh, a strong family history of colon cancer, um, but you just, you know, um, are a, a run of the mill average risk person, we, we historically have said 50 years old is when you should begin getting screened. Um, there have been some organizations and societies who have recommended getting screened earlier. Um, in particular, uh, the American Cancer Society has recommended screening at the age of 45 years. And then recently, the United States Preventive Service Task Force, um, which is a body of experts in public health and doctors and cancer that make recommendations um, that usually are the basis for what insurance companies uh, will reimburse, um, they put out a statement that says they're probably going to change their recommendation to 45 as well. So most indicators are pointing now to 45 years old being the age that an average person to start to be screened. And Dr. Mizrahi, how often should you get screened for colon cancer? So it depends is the short answer. Uh, the long answer is, um, it can be as frequently as once a year if you are using a stool-based test. So again, if you are giving a stool sample to your doctor, taking a kit home, uh, it can be every year or every three years, depending on which test you and your doctor decide on. Um, if you're doing something like a colonoscopy, where they're um, doing the camera and looking inside of you, if you have a normal colonoscopy, you actually don't need another one until 10 years later. So let's say you get your first one at the age of 45 then you wouldn't need another one until 55, assuming it's completely normal. Now, if they find some abnormalities in there, some precancerous lesions, um, that recommendation for when your next one is might change and be a little bit shorter, uh, maybe even three to five years, depending on what they find. Uh, so it does vary based on which uh, test you do. Uh, so it could be as frequently as every year or as infrequently as once every 10 years. And speaking of colonoscopies, Dr. Jancic, why are they so important? They're so important because this is a highly preventable cancer. And it is estimated that up to one third of patients who are eligible for colon cancer are not getting screened. So that's why it is so important because we can detect colon cancer through our colonoscopies and actually catch them when they're precancerous and before they turn into colon cancer. And we do have a Facebook Live uh, question here, and they're asking, if I don't pass a stool every day, should I be worried? Should I get screened even though I'm in my early 30s? Um, I, I, I can take a stab at that one if you'd like. So um, it's a great question. Um, you know, it's it's. It's difficult to interpret in a vacuum. Um, you know, obviously I don't know you and, and, and um, I would wanna know your family history, what other symptoms you might be having, um, but certainly people's normal uh, bowel regimens uh, vary from person to person. So for what is normal for me may be abnormal for you. Um, so if you are someone who regularly goes to the bathroom and has a bowel movement once a day, and then there is a change and you're going once every three days, once every four days, and there's not an obvious reason why that's happening based on your diet, then that is something I would consider discussing with your primary care provider. Could that be an indication of cancer? It's possible. There are probably other more likely explanations, but it's not something I would dismiss, especially considering that we are seeing colon cancer being more common in younger folks. So uh, yes, the short answer is it 
Is possible that it could be an indication of colon cancer? Is it the most likely explanation? Probably not, but I would encourage uh, someone having their symptoms and if you are, you know, uh, evaluated by your physician. So Dr. Mizrahi, if there is a family history of colon cancer, when should someone get screened? Yeah, so we, I talked earlier about the average risk patient getting screened starting at the age of 45 or 50, depending on the guidelines. Uh, that is different if you have a family history. Specifically, if you have a first degree family member with a history of colorectal cancer. So what that means first degree is a sibling, uh, a parent, um, and, um, and what I would recommend at that point is that you get screened approximately 10 years before their age of diagnosis. So what I mean by that is, is let's say you had a mother who developed colon cancer at the age of 47. So I would recommend you get screened at the age of 37. Um, so not wait until 45, which is the recommendation for the average risk patient, but you get screened 10 years before the diagnosis of that first degree relative. Now, if it's not a first degree relative or it's multiple you know, cousins or aunts, uncles, I would have that conversation with your physician about when the timing is right for you. But um, I would use the 10 years uh, guideline before the diagnosis of a first degree relative. And Dr. Jancic, does colon cancer show up in a blood test? Um, there's a blood test called the CEA, which is a tumor marker, and this is used once you're diagnosed with colon cancer, and it can be used uh, when it's when the levels rise, it can be used to indicate colon cancer, but also when those levels fall, this could be an indication of treatment, and if the levels start to rise again, an indication that the colon cancer has come back. It is not used as a screening test. The reason being that it can also be elevated with some other cancers. Uh, lung cancer may elevate it, ovarian cancer may elevate it, but also some conditions that are non-cancerous or what we call benign may also elevate it. Cirrhosis, uh, heavy smokers, that may also elevate your CEA level. So while it's not good as a screening test, it is used in those patients mostly in advanced cancers when they are diagnosed and it helps us to kind of monitor their treatment with the rise and falls of the levels. Dr. Jancic, can you see colon cancer during a colonoscopy? Yes, you can. You can see a colon cancer during a colonoscopy, which is why it's so important to get screened. Um, I know I keep reiterating that, but it is important. You absolutely can see a colon cancer. It may be uh, a mass, so you might have a mass that is blocking uh, part of that colon. Um, it may just be what we call a polyp that is turned cancerous. Um, th those abnormal growths that can happen um, along the colon. Um, it is estimated that patients over the age of 50, as many as you know, 20 to 30% of us may have some polyps, but only 1% may be cancer. So that's why it is important for us to get screened because you want to get this in the early stages or before it turns into cancer. Dr. Jancic, what is the first sign of colon cancer? So that depends. Um, sometimes you might not have any signs. If it's a really early stage, um, you might not have any signs at all, which is why we need to get screened. In our advanced stages, you can see symptoms such as a change in bowel habits, um, you know, diarrhea, constipation, or a feeling like um, you've gone to the bathroom, but feeling like you, you have an urge, a sensation to go to the bathroom again and have another bowel movement. Um, abdominal pain, weight loss, uh, sometimes fatigue, weakness, but also some patients may present with just uh, incidental finding of anemia, particularly iron deficiency anemia. Uh, this sometimes can also be an indication of colon cancer and needs to be further evaluated. Dr. Jancic, at what stage does colon cancer start to show symptoms? Again, that, that depends. Again, it can be in your more advanced stages. In your early stages, you might not have any symptoms at all. So usually, typically in our advanced stages, uh, once if it has spread outside of the colon to the lymph nodes 
or to other sites like the liver, the lung, we typically see those uh, signs that I talked about. If it's in our early stages, um, you might not see any signs at all. So what are the four stages of colon cancer, Dr. Dantich? Um, Well, the stages are based on the extent of disease at the time of diagnosis. Um, and that will depend on, you know, once you've had the surgery or the removal of the cancer. Um, as I mentioned before, colon cancer is, um, the colon is made up of layers. And these layers are involved in mucosa, submucosa, muscle layers. So there's actually a stage zero, which is, we call that, an, that's a very early stage. Uh, that's a carcinoma in situ where it has not even spread um, beyond or into the inner layers, okay? That's in the submucosa. Stage one is also considered an early stage. And if we catch it at stage one, there's a 90% five-year survival rate. That is confined to the innermost uh, layers of the colon. Stage two is a little more advanced, and that means that the colon cancer is then advanced beyond the inner layers to the outer layers. Sometimes maybe have gone through those outer layers, but it does it has not spread to the lymph nodes or any what we would call distant sites. Distant sites being sites outside of the colon, namely liver and lung being uh, uh, possibilities, uh, common sites that it may spread. Um, Stage three means that the colon cancer has spread to the lymph nodes. Um, It can involve any of the layers, but what really makes the stage three is its involvement of the lymph nodes. And stage four means that that cancer, that's the most advanced stage, it has spread out of the colon and has gone to other sites. Um, And those other sites, again, could be liver, lung, or, or what we call the peritoneal cavity. Dr. Mizrahi, how curable is colon cancer? So that's a complicated question. Um, it's, it very much depends on what Dr. Jancic was just talking about in, in the stage at which someone is diagnosed. Um, I mean, she, she presented a number of 90% um, uh, curable uh, if a patient is in a very early stage, such as stage one cancer. So like she explained, stage one cancer, it has very little invasion into the colon and really no involvement of any surrounding structures. Um, Once you start getting to more advanced stages, the chance of being cured does get lower. Um, And that goes back to the importance of getting screened and getting uh, findings of colon cancer early because your chance of cure is better the earlier the cancer is found. So if you take patients with uh, stage two colon cancer, for example, um, you uh, are getting cure rates that are not quite 90% are still quite high in the 80s uh, or so percent. Once you start to get to stage three, meaning the uh, lymph nodes are involved, then uh, the cure rate starts to get into the 60s, 70s percent. Um, And then um, stage four colon cancer, historically, we have kind of explained that uh, stage four colon cancer is not curable. It's not a disease that we can make go away forever. More recently, we have found that with some aggressive treatments of patients with um, stage four cancer, where it's only spread maybe in one or two spots. So I'll give you an example. If a patient has a tumor that started in their colon and we find at the time of diagnosis or even sometime after they've had treatment that there is a spot in the the liver that um, we biopsy and we find out that that is the colon cancer having spread to the liver. Technically, that is stage four disease. However, uh, with modern treatments and surgical techniques, some of those patients, we can remove that cancer from the liver Um, and have them live a very long time, potentially even curing some of those patients. So um, what we look at in terms of how we define cure, most oncologists will think of patients who are alive five years after their diagnosis because it's rare for the cancer to come back after five years. So um, in patients with stage four cancer, uh, what percent of them are alive at five years? You're talking about about 15%. So it is a very low percentage compared to the other stages, uh, but certainly... Uh, not all stage four colon cancers are are created equal, I would say. 
And Dr. Mizrahi, what kind of treatments are available if you're diagnosed with colon cancer? So um, it depends on the stage. So the early stage cancers, um, so stage one, two, and three are typically uh, treated with surgical resection, meaning you go, you, you see a surgeon, they take you to the operating room and either through a laparoscopic method, so a minimally invasive where you don't have many large um, ab abdominal uh, openings and scars, uh, they can remove the colon cancer, remove surrounding lymph nodes. They wanna get an adequate number of lymph nodes so that they can tell whether the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes. Um, sometimes based on the location or what have you, they might need to do an open surgery where they make a bigger incision in your abdomen. Um, but still the, the intent is the same is to remove the primary cancer, remove an adequate number of lymph nodes so you can get a good assessment of if and how far this has spread. Um, depending on the findings, which would then be sent to a pathologist who looks under the microscope, sees if there's any tumor involvement, um, basically in the primary tumor, how deeply it, it invades and then looks at the lymph nodes. Then we make a decision of based on that information and how much involvement there is, should this patient receive chemotherapy? The goal of that chemotherapy, if it's recommended, is to try to prevent the cancer from coming back. And we know that in certain patients who have certain findings, such as lymph nodes that are positive or um, other high-risk features, uh, they may benefit from chemotherapy in order to prevent the cancer from coming back. If you're diagnosed at, with stage four colon cancer, except for the subset that I mentioned earlier, where there's just a couple spots that might have spread, typically the mainstay treatment of stage four colon cancer is chemotherapy. Um, and, and that's um, uh, something where we always are looking for new innovative ways to treat patients with clinical trials, um, either when they're initially diagnosed with stage four cancer or after they've had some chemotherapy. Um, and those might bring in some kind of novel ways to treat cancer, but chemotherapy remains kind of the mainstay treatment of stage four colon cancer. So Dr. Mizrahi, if you have stage one colon cancer, would it require chemotherapy or would that be for a further along stage? So stage one colon cancer typically does not require chemotherapy. I would not recommend it to my patients uh, in absence of you know, some other compelling reason that I can't even think of right now. Um, so, um, Usually surgery is adequate. Uh, when you get to stage two, some patients might require chemotherapy, it depends. And then stage three, for most patients, it is recommended. And then of course we talked about stage four, but stage one, uh, no, uh, we typically do not recommend chemotherapy. And Dr. Jancic, what are the risk factors of colon cancer? Good question. Um, some risk factors, um, are things we can't fix like age and some we can. So colon cancer typically tends to occur in patients 50 plus. So aging is a risk factor. Um, also genetics. So if you're anyone in your family and these are immediates like Dr. Mizrahi mentioned, your mom, your dad, your sibling, uh, brother, uh, sister, siblings uh, had colon cancer, that increases your risk. Any genetic disorder, something called Lynch syndrome, um, uh, FAP, which is familial adenomatous polyposis, that can also increase your risk. All those, these account for not many of the colon cancers we see today, maybe only 5%. Um, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, that increases your risk. Um, because it, it, it induces a state of chronic inflammation of the colon, so that increases your risk. Also, diet. Um, diet is important. A high-fiber, uh, low-fat diet is recommended, but patients who have a high-fat diet or diet and processed meats, uh, which includes you know eating um, bacon, hot dogs, uh, just one hot dog a day could significantly actually increase your colon cancer risk, maybe up to uh, upwards of uh, increase and greater of 10% than normal. Um, so it is all other risks um, besides that includes diabetics increase your risk and the African American population have an increased risk. Um, obesity is a risk, sedentary lifestyle also a risk. 
So all of these things uh, are risks contributing to colon cancer. Um, I don't know if I also mentioned alcohol intake, heavy alcohol intake, and smokers also have an increased risk. So what can we do to decrease our risk of colon cancer? Well, there's things that we can't fix. Uh, we can't control our age or aging. Um, we can't control our genetics. But things we can control is our diet. You know, drinking at least five glasses of water a day has proved to decrease your risk. Um, less processed meats, more plant-based diets, that can improve um, um, our risk of getting colon cancer. Quitting smoking, limiting our alcohol intake, and of course, uh, being active. All these things we can do to decrease our risk. So I'd like to ask you both, you know, what questions should I ask my doctor before going to get screened? Um, and Dr. Mizrahi, you can, you can start first. So I think the primary question you want to ask is, um, should I be screened? And that, and what that primarily gets at is um, how old are you and what your risk is. Um, and that will help your physician determine uh, at what age you should begin screening. It kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. So the average risk person who doesn't have, you know, some of the syndromes that Dr. Zanzich mentioned, doesn't have um, a strong family history, should be screened either at 45 or 50. So that's a question you should ask your physician is, should I even be screened? Um, and the next question I would ask is what screening test is best for me? So, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are some that are as simple as uh, giving a stool sample once a year to your doctor. Uh, I hope that sounds simple. It's, uh, you know, uh, maybe not the most pleasant thing in the world, but it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, uh, you know, that might be a great screening test for um, someone who maybe does not want to or has some reason that they can't uh, have a colonoscopy at a certain point in time. Maybe they're on a blood thinner and they can't come off the blood thinner to have a colonoscopy. Uh, there are different reasons why maybe a stool sample test might be best for you. So you should ask your doctor, what's the best screening test for me? If if you said, I am someone who wants to have the least frequent screening test possible, then maybe doing a colonoscopy makes the most sense for you. Now, one thing we, we didn't really mention before about the screening test, and I think this is important, is that if you have an abnormal screening test that's not a colonoscopy. So for example, let's say you have this CAT scan uh, that uh, visualizes your colon or you have a, a stool-based test that looks for blood or DNA changes. And if that is abnormal, so meaning they're finding something that is concerning for maybe pre-cancer or cancer, the next step is actually to do a colonoscopy. So um, colonoscopy uh, is uh, a treatment uh, it offers treatment because it can remove precancerous lesions, um, and it, it's a it's a screening tool that's used uh, for patients who have abnormal uh, screening tests. Otherwise, so I would ask, what screening test is best for me? Um, in terms of any other questions, um, you know, it, depending on what screening test is recommended, um, you know, I would ask, um, what do I need to do to prepare? So, um, you know, we, we know that um, uh, for a colonoscopy, um, you do need to do what's called a, a, a bowel prep, meaning that you um, uh, drink a, uh, usually something that flushes out your, your system so that everything is clear so that when the GI physicians uh, go in with their cameras, they can actually uh, see. If it's filled with stool still, it is uh, very difficult for them to assess whether there are any polyps if there's something really large, usually they can see it, but if it's something small, um, they might not be able to visualize it if there's a lot of stool. So it does require uh, preparation of the bowel. Usually most people say that's the most unpleasant part of it uh, the night before and flushing out their system. Um, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the process and, and make sure that it's a successful exam. Um, and then, you know, I would also ask like what, what, what I expect. I mean, is this something that's gonna be painful? Am I going to be asleep? Am I going to be awake? And usually these are questions that your primary doctor who's going to order the test can answer for you, but there might be questions they might defer to the person who is uh, performing the test, particularly if we're talking about a colonoscopy, then that's a question that sometimes might be best addressed by a GI physician, the gastroenterologist who's actually performing the colonoscopy. Right. right. So, you know, if I could just jump in there for a second. Um, other questions you would want to ask um, 
is of course any potential complications associated with the procedure. Um, the recovery time, you know, do I have to be out of work or what can I expect in terms of, you know, the procedure, any pain, pain at the site? Um, do I need someone to go with me to the procedure? That's also very important. And when could I expect my results? Would the results be immediate? Or, you know, who would be in charge of um, informing me of my results? That's also important. And typically it's the gastroenterologist that performs these procedures. Uh, a lot of the procedures are performed under sedation. So you also want to ask what your risks are associated with sedation. And what could you expect in terms of how long will you be under sedation? How long is the actual procedure? Um, and, you know, typically the procedure is not long itself, but you would have to be there for at least, you know, expect to be there for two hours or so. Um, but all this uh, would be explained to you in detail prior to the procedure. And of course, your expectations after and any uh, recovery that, that is necessary. And as we wrap up today, don't forget that it is safe to go to the doctor. Don't delay your medical care. This does include cancer screenings that can save your life. And I just want to yes. thank all of our viewers today for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Mizrahi and Dr. Jancic. Um, and thank you for joining our team of oncologists. You know, we're here to help. So you can definitely visit auctioner.org slash screenings to get screened today. Or you can also call 866 355-6266 to make an appointment to get screened today. Thank you.